I'm hoping we're in action here. This is how all Zoom events begin, tentatively, hopefully, optimistically. Um, but uh, I shall begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome tonight to tonight's Atlantic Book Awards event, Creating Short Fiction Collections, presented in partnership with the Writers Federation of Nova Scotia. My name is Alexander McLeod and I teach at St. Mary's and I write short stories. And this award, I, wanna, I want to extend um, the thanks from my mom, Anita McLeod, and from all of my uh, siblings, my brothers and my sister, uh, to the Writers' Federation and to the Atlantic Book Awards for uh, naming this award in honor of, of our dad. Uh, it means a lot to us. Every year it means a lot to us. Perhaps nobody uh, cared for this form as much as uh, dad did. And it's a great honor for us to see his uh, commitment um, to, the, to the genre carry on and be honored in this way. So uh, every year we feel uh, very blessed and grateful. So uh, I'm moderating this event tonight. Uh, and um, it's, uh, I just want to tell all of you that this particular uh, finalist shortlist is spectacular. And uh, though I had no role in the uh, selecting of these people, I also want to thank these unseen people who work so hard behind the scenes, the jurors, the entire, um, the entire organizational infrastructure of the of the Atlantic Book Awards for pulling this together. For readers, it's should, I hope a special joy for you to see these artists in action. Uh, also, it is our privilege and responsibility to start all of our evenings off by acknowledging the land on which we gather for the Atlantic Book Awards Festival. Uh, this event, as we can see, is being held online, and sometimes that gives people the idea that they are deterritorialized. So it's always important to re-territorialize ourselves and actually think about the physical uh, space uh, we inhabit. So though the organizers are aware that a singular land acknowledgement does not capture the richness of our uh, distribution across many locations in Atlantic Canada, uh, and beyond, because the majority of, of these events are being held this year in Shibukto, also known as Halifax, we'd like to share the acknowledgement that is typically used here. This virtual event was produced in Mi'kmaq, the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We recognize the peace and friendship treaties signed between the British Crown and the Mi'kmaq from 1760 to 1769. We are a treaty people, and we have rights and responsibilities as Mi'kmaq and settlers alike. People watching this video from elsewhere are invited to consider their own position with regard to the land where they fall them, find themselves. The Atlantic Book Awards Gala will be presented on Thursday, June 9th at the Paul O'Regan Hall at the Halifax Central Library, another great temple of reading, starting at 7 p.m. Uh, and hosted by CTV's Latavia Beezer. Uh, the awards will also be live streamed for book lovers everywhere. To learn more about the gala and the next week of festival events, please visit www.atlanticbookawards.ca where you can purchase gala tickets or access the live stream. Um, so logistically, housekeeping, before we get started, I also want to mention that if you have any questions for our authors, the kind of average audience Q&A stuff, um, please submit them. Um, type them in here uh, via the Q&A function or the chat, and we will get to them at the 7.45 mark. So we're not going to be watching them uh, as they come in, but we'll try to answer audience questions beginning at 7.45. That's our goal. Okay, uh, so I'll just tell you the brief layout of what's going to happen. I'll introduce our three speakers. Each of them will read for three minutes to give you a sample of uh, the the pros that you'll be seeing in these books. Then we're gonna have a chat um, about the topic of this uh, panel, which I'm very interested in, creating short fiction collections. I have a lot of questions about that in verb. Uh, and then um, we open it up to the group and then we say goodbye. So that's our plan. Everyone will know where we are at each stage of the game. So I'm gonna begin with David Huber. 
his writing has won the CBC Short Story Prize, the Walrus, Walrus, Walrus Poetry Prize. That's hard to say. The, Wal, the Walrus Poetry Prize. And why I, I didn't practice my elocution for this. Uh, David Hubert's writing, writing has won the CBC Short Story Prize, the Walrus Poetry Prize, and was a finalist for the 2020 Journey Prize. David's fictional debut, Peninsula Sinking, won a Dartmouth Book Award and was shortlisted previously for the Alistair McLeod Short Fiction Prize and was a runner up for the Danuta Gleed Award. David's work has been published in magazines such as The Walrus, again, Maisonneuve, En Route, and Canadian Notes and Queries, and anthologized in Best Canadian Short Stories and the Journey Prize Stories. David teaches writing and creative writing at the University, teaches literature and creative writing at the University of New Brunswick. His book, Chemical Valley, was also nominated for the 2022 Thomas Hedridal Rattle Atlantic Fiction Award. Chemical, Valley, Chemical Valley's compassionate and carefully wrought stories cultivate rich emotional worlds in and through the darkness of our biochemical animacy. Wow. Amber <laughs> McMillan is the author of the memoir, The Woods, a year, a year on Protection Island and the poetry collection, We Can't Ever Do This Again. Her work has also appeared in Prism International, ARC Poetry Magazine, and The Walrus. She lives in Fredericton. The Running Trees, for which Amber is nominated, uh, leads readers into a series of conversations to reveal characters in fumbling bouts of brutality, reflection, isolation, and love. The Running Trees explores how we desperately try to communicate with each other amid the gaps in meaning we create. Claire Wilkshire is a writer and editor in St. John's, the Love Olympics, a collection of short fiction, is her second book. The first is a novel, Maxine, from 2013. Both were published by the great Breakwater Books. Claire lives in St. John's with her family. The stories in the Love Olympics for which she is nominated follow an interlocking set of characters and the people they love. Characters weave their way in and out of this collection of short fiction set in St. John's. The book is about various forms of love, it certainly is. The way love grips us, shakes us, releases us, or envelops us. As I said before, I can't imagine that there's a short list of three books of short stories better than this. Uh, they, they cover so much territory and have so much wild variety, so much wild variety inside them uh, that as I think you'll see, uh, it should be a treat. So we didn't set our, our, our order, but I think if you're okay, writers, we'll just follow that uh, alphabetical order. And Mr. Hubert, uh, you are first to the mic. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, much appreciated. Can't wait to take the walrus right out of my bio. Um, <laughs> looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I just wanted to thank the McLeod family. Um, this prize is uh, in the McLeod name. And um, as Alex pointed out, there's really good reason for that. And I've been reading, I've been on a McLeod reading journey <laughs> lately <laughs> myself, reading both Alex and, um, and Alistair as well. So it's been a nice opportunity to revisit that work. And I wanted to briefly thank as well, everyone at the uh, Writers Fed and the Atlantic Book Awards, always so great. Uh, and I'm so appreciative for all the work that you do. So I'm just going to read a very quick ex excerpt that I think will give you sort of some of the tone of one of these stories, the title story, which is called Chemical Valley, and is about an oil refinery worker named Jer. Um, I'll dive in. I'm telling Eileen how I want to be buried, namely inside a tree. We're sitting in bed, eating Thai from the mall, and listening to the 6 p.m. construction outside our window the city tearing up the whole street along with tree roots and a rusted tangle of lead pipes. And I'm telling Eileen, it's called a biodegradable burial pod. Mouth full of cashew curry and I'm saying what they do is put your remains in this egg looking thing like the xenomorphs cocoon from Alien Resurrection but it's made of biodegradable plastic. I'm telling Eileen it's called Capsula Mundi and what they do is hitch the remains to a semi-mature tree and plant the whole package. Stuff you down in fetal position and let you gradually decay until you become nitrogen, seep into soil. Contemplating Penang, Eileen asks where I got the idea about the burial pod and I tell her Facebook or maybe an email newsletter. 
you click on that shit. Why are you even thinking about this now? You just turned 34. Picking a bamboo shoot from her molars, she says, since when are you into trees? She says it's smug. She says it like Miss University Sciences and nobody else is allowed to like trees. I don't tell her how we're all compost. And yes, I read that on a Facebook link. I also do not tell her about the article's tagline, your carbon footprint doesn't end in the grave. Reaching for the pad tie, I tell her about the balance, how it's only natural, how the human body is rich in nitrogen, how when you use a coffin, there's a lot of waste because the body just rots on its own when it could be giving nutrients to the system. Not to mention all the metals and treated woods and coffins. I tell her how the idea is to phase out traditional graveyards entirely, replace them with grave forests. Hmm, Eileen says, gazing out the window. Is this a guilt thing from working at the plants? So I'm gonna end it there, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that story gets weirder. <laughs> um, Amber. <laughs> Hi. I'm gonna read from the, the first story in my collection, The Running Trees. And it's going to be in the middle of the story and I'm gonna end it in the middle of the story. Okay. You're not going to get a full picture here, which is good. That's what we want. Kevin set up his tiny bedroom as precisely as he did everything else. He stood in the doorway holding a piece of paper with his meticulous layout. He came prepared. He stood there with this piece of paper, remeasured everything, and then tediously reassembled the furniture to match his drawing exactly. He looked at the paper, then at the room, and then back to the paper several times before he was satisfied everything was right. I took a picture of him standing in the door of his finally finished bedroom so he could have it and be proud of what he'd done. Kevin was wearing a white t-shirt and stood against a white wall, looking like a floating head in the center of an otherwise blank space. When I developed it later, it was just like photos I'd seen in fishing magazines, where the guy is standing on a dock holding his fish in the air, as proud as possible. From the beginning, Kevin turned out to be a good choice. In the mornings, he would get up, make us both coffee from a fancy French press, and practice classical piano quietly so as not to wake me. He made really spiffy meals, too like eggs Florentine and sushi and glazed meat. He always made enough for me. And then on Sundays, we'd do crosswords together that took most of the day. He'd usually start the crossword and leave a whole bunch of the easier clues for me to finish. But we were both students. Our evenings were spent either studying or writing papers. And on the weekends, we'd have friends over. I always had wine and always drank a lot of it. Kevin preferred beer and really great food, food that he loved to make and loved to share with anyone that was over. It was the kind of roommate situation that was uncommon among my friends and my age group. It was pleasing, easy, and undramatic. I readily came to rely on him for these comforts and expected them without any sense that I owed him for anything. Eric was 12 years older than me, and we had nothing in common. I think I liked Eric at first because he was because living with Kevin had given me the false idea that I could run with adults, that I was perfectly suited to a sophisticated relationship with a grown man. I think Eric liked me because I had big knockers and a child's face. I think he was charmed by my consistently messy appearance that I would make plans with him and later forget about them, and that I would sneak into his house late at night, stinking of liquor, and crawl up the stairs and under his sheets to cuddle and screw. Eric had a serious job in environmental conservation at Greenpeace. 
not the kind where they don't pay you to go around knocking on doors for donations or whatever. He had his own office and a telephone number, and the boss would invite him over for dinner sometimes. Eric always had lots of emails to send and receive, a house in the annex, a real house that he didn't share for rent with anyone else, and he dressed really nice. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. He was tall and handsome. He didn't look like anyone I had ever dated. He didn't look like anyone I would ever know. Thanks so much. Thank you, Amber. That story has some uh, um, stunning wardrobe, stunning wardrobe. It has wardrobe. It has it has wardrobe. It has it has it has wardrobe. Wardrobe is it important. Has, it has a wardrobe consideration. Yes. <laughs> well put. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Claire. Okay. Thanks. Um, I would like to thank the organizers, the Writers Federation, the Atlantic Book Awards people, and the jurors for their hard work on these events. I can't imagine how much work it must be to pull this all together. And Alex and his family for their longstanding contribution to Canadian literature. Um, I'm going to read uh, from the first story in my collection. The story is called Mothers, and it's about what often happens in Newfoundland, which is that young people go away um, for work or for university. And so it's about what happens when they come back on holiday. Over the long weekend, they burrow into the couch with blankets. They spend the morning watching videos, sending messages, snorting as they point out funny memes to each other. They spend hours gearing up to work on assignments for courses. And you start to wonder if you should make suggestions, turn off the music, set a timer, but all of a sudden, when the afternoon is already well underway, they slave away for half an hour and suddenly, bingo, the assignment is done. They wonder if they can defrost something for lunch. After lunch, they eat the grapes, all the grapes. They eat chips, they locate the crackers and the good cheese. You come into the kitchen when they have gone out and gather up the plates, the phone chargers, the half-empty Diet Coke bottles, the bowls with remnants of cereal or pea soup mugs with dregs of lemon tea. You rinse the coffee grounds out of the French press and put the guitar back in its case and fold the throw on the armchair and load the dishwasher and turn it on. You wipe down the table and soon comes the thud of the front door and they are back. Their arms circle around you and they are laughing. You are laughing. They are young and strong and warm except for the frozen hands they put at the back of your neck to make you squeak. And you put out more food. You tell them to help themselves to settle in, to be comfortable, to leave their laundry in a pile in the hall because you'll throw on a load for them later. And they laugh again because they don't care about laundry. But really, you'd like to do their laundry. You look at a pair of feet and say, are those my socks? and a finger is placed on your lips while someone goes, shh. You would like to do whatever would make their day easier. You want them to feel good here, to want to come home, to bring their light and their warmth and their smiles into the house and deposit them everywhere like flotsam, like little bunches of grapes, close and fat and sweet. The night before they leave, they traips, traips into the bedroom while you're in the ensuite with the door open. They drape themselves over your bed, one on top of the comforter and the other underneath, one with limbs all sprawly, the other bunched up for maximal heat conservation. They are gazing up at the ceiling or into the screen of a phone, and their words come out in little lazy clumps with long spaces between them as you brush your teeth and wipe your mouth. No one is addressing anyone in particular as you lift the edge of the comforter and crawl in, pushing gently at the nesting one who shuffles over a little to make room. And you're three quarters asleep by the time they roll slowly over and brush lips up against your cheek and murmur goodnight. The bed heaves and they pad away to their rooms as you roll into the warm space they've vacated and try to pretend that they're still there, that the alarm won't go off in the middle of the night and set your heart skittering around like a baby goat, that you won't check the departures website and help load their bags into the trunk and wait until they've checked in just in case and walk them to the security area and squeeze them tight and turn away quickly, rubbing the back of your hand over your cheek and heading out in the dark to the cold, empty car.
as promised audience what did i tell you what did i tell you see this is <laughs> these are some pros uh i believe that amber and claire's stories could be like from the opposite side uh but claire actually read you the end of that story the beginning of that story the beginning of that story is about uh assembling the furniture for these punks uh in their in their in their cool apartments uh and i read that to my ungrateful daughter uh and she's like that's exactly what it was like that's exactly what it was like when you're dropping them off <laughs> so anyway um my uh my personal life doesn't matter uh i have questions though uh i have questions and i'm grateful for this topic when i saw it i was like hmm, i've been in lots of panel discussions before but i don't think i've seen this verb which is about creating short story collections and that is what i'm focused on um so um creating short story collections since this is an award for a collection is um tricky um because i don't think we talk about it very much we talk about individual stories we talk about novels and i have a whole bunch of poetry collections around here and i know i know uh, amber and david have written po so poetry collections we talk about poetry collection collections a lot because we think a, a poetry collection kind of has a, a cohesion to it but i'm wondering about in this collection, on this collection of collection makers, uh, could you tell me a little bit, each of you, about what you think makes a good collection? Do you are you are you on the variety side? You like to see a a, a range of material, a range of techniques, um, you know, kind of aesthetic, different aesthetic valences, or do you like? Uh, you know the masters doing their one thing perfectly repeating it again and again and i know it's a it's just an interesting question it's not it's not exactly about later on we'll come to how you built your own collections but i'm asking you now as a reader as a reader of short story collections uh what are you looking for or what do you think makes what do you think creates a successful short story collection We can all have our mics on, I think, so we can talk to each other. Anyone want to try? The, the story collections that I'm drawn the most to, uh, and again, like just personally speaking, um, are the ones that I can draw what I think of as intimacy between me and the author. Um, so that can be achieved in a lot of different ways. It can be achieved through language, can be achieved through context, but I want that relatability or I need it to think that I can be, uh, that I can see a collection through to the end and then maybe even go ahead and say that, that I loved it or this is a great collection, that degree of intimacy has to be met. In, in all the story, like, do you see it? Do you see it? I guess I'm not talking about like, the way collections have separate stories in them or linked stories. Um, but do you see that, I am super interested in this because I feel the same way, but uh, is that intimacy carried like from story to story or does the intimacy work in, in different ways from story to story? Do you see it that way or, or is it the same sort of intimacy? I think the, the kind I'm thinking about in my head right now is the kind that's that is in the author's voice or, or the narrator's voice, depending on how the, the story is structured. But I think it has everything to do with voice, which is of course a very difficult to, to talk about and even understand sort of mm -hmm. mechanism of all of this. Yeah. Does that help? Does that? That's, that's exactly what I'm interested in. Yeah, just seeing how, what, what practitioners think makes it tick in, in other people. What do you think, Claire? I don't have, I mean, I used to think that I really wanted variety in a collection and I wasn't interested in story cycles, uh, which I sort of just written. <laughs> Whoops. Um, but yeah, oops, that was an accident. Um, and, but now I think I just really like both. I mean, I like kind of Olive Kitteridge and that that portrait of, of that sensibility and the use of language and but I also like something where the tone is completely different, where there's long stories and short stories and, and just wild 
a variety. Um, so I don't know that there is a way to build a collection. I think I, uh, I'm open to all kinds of collections. And what, what I want is I want a, a good sentence or a good image or, in fact, um, Alex, I was, uh, I was reading uh, not very long ago your story that was published in The New Yorker earlier this year. And early in that story, the father is holding a baby and uh, the baby is drooling. And uh, the phrase that we get is a creamy rivulet of drool. And I thought, I'm in, <laughs> I want to read the rest. Of, I don't care what happens in the rest of the story. I am sold on All creamy you need is a creamy of rivulet of drool. of drool. Okay, yeah. I'll read the whole book just for that line. So <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. I want a good line. David? Um, yeah, well, I'll just take a different approach as much as I love um, creamy rivulets of drool. Um, I, uh, I, I like a vision. I think uh, what we get from a great writer, what we get from a strong writer, um, what we get from a developed writer is a vision. Um, and we get that in a short story collection or, or a novel, we get a way of looking at the world, um, a unique and distilled way of looking at the world that's offered to us through the guise of fiction. That's what a short story collection, short story collection does that, it presents that a different, a little differently than a novel does. Um, although a novel can do that in a sort of a vast capacious variety of ways as well. Um, short story, you know, words that come to mind for me are constellation and archipelago. Like that's the kind of, that's sort of, I want a, a more lateral landscape, <laughs> I guess. And I think readers generally want a more lateral landscape from a short story collection than sort of a, you know, propulsive, a more forward-looking, a more projectile type vision from a novel. But I think vision, so for me, I mean, atmosphere is very much first and foremost, and that's what I'm describing. And like, you know, I think of Faulkner, um, I think of George Saunders, I think of Laurie Moore, um, uh, writers I admire, right? Uh, Lauren Groff and um, all of them, they, they create an atmosphere. And all in all those cases, actually, the atmosphere is a little bit, and the vision is, more than real <laughs> or other than para-real, we might say as well. So uh, obviously that's something that's attractive for me as well. But I think, you know, I was reading an um, amazing book, uh, Gerald Murnane, it's my Murnane moment, The Plains. And uh, Murnane is somebody who said, I would think that all fiction was speculative, right? <laughs> so um, so just a, an excuse for me in, in that sort of attraction is that I also think all fiction um, offers that kind of slightly bizarre twisted vision um, yeah yeah, that's what yeah. I, take. I think that's all beautiful uh, i think it's also like the way we think of artists that we like in any art that we like we like i think what amber said like we like we like their tone we like their style so like style is is miraculous because you're like it's never exhausted and you're like oh the way that person does it whatever they're doing i'll be interested uh and then sometimes you're like whew, uh that's um but i uh, but i do find um just maybe, I know all of you have experience in workshops and teaching. I do find that sometimes we're pushing something uh, to be, sometimes we push for difference. And then in the end, our style just comes through anyway. <laughs> so you're like, oh, well, there it is. It did every point of view and 28,000 characters. And in the end, it was just an Amber story or a David story or a Claire. It was a Claire story from the beginning. It's just, you know, the style just comes through. So keeping on this um, notion of creating, I want to pay tribute to the great editors that you people have. Uh, the astounding Jessica Grant, the amazing Bethany Gibson, and our pal, <laughs> John Metcalf. Um, so uh, I think for the audience, they maybe don't know that the three of you have worked with three really, really perceptive uh, art artists, readers who helped you along in the creating of these collections. Can we talk a little bit about your relationship with these people uh, and how they, uh, what role they played in creating, this is sticking to the topic, creating these short story collections. I don't believe you did it all by yourself. So um, let's talk about, I have a tortured relationship with editors too. But, so uh, who wants to go first on, on, on their treasured editor or their tumultuous editor? I'll go first. And I'll say, too, when you held up a poetry collection a minute ago, you held up Chris Bailey's. I did. 
from PEI. So or, yeah, so another another Atlantic province represented here in today's um, today's panel. But I say that because I was the editor for that book, and here we are talking about editing. Mm -hmm. So that's a funny little what my husband calls a goocher. That's a funny little goocher. So Bethany was my editor, and wasn't I delighted to open the, the mailbox one day to find a huge paper manuscript mailed to me of my book in which Bethany had gone over, you know, line by line, page by page with a, with a delicate pencil, um, you know, the entire 300 or whatever pages and made these, um, uh, how to describe, but not, not so much correctional editing, but more like asking me questions at key moments in the story. Um, and in, in so doing, forcing a tighter vision, to use one of David's words for tonight. Um, and that, as an editor, I thought was, I mean, tremendous, because as a writer, that's what I need. I need to know how things are being perceived rather than how to fix my, my thing to match the editor or the publisher's, uh, you know, vision for oh, my book. being perceived, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, and so I did. So that for me was a really important aspect of the editing process. I felt really um, carried by somebody who who really did seem to know more than I did about my own stories. <laughs> so that's special. I don't. I don't think it happens all the time. So. What about Jessica? She's one of my absolute one of my favorite writers in the whole world. What was that like working with Jessica? She's one of my favorite writers in the whole world too. Uh, Come Thou Tortoise is just, I mean, I love all her books, but Come Thou Tortoise is, yep. is very close to my heart. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard to describe what it's like to work with someone like Jessica. One thing, there are so many things that I love that she does, but one thing she does is to provide a long and very detailed set of notes, um, not in the manuscript, although she will comment in the manuscript, but, but there's a sort of long letter about the book in which um, often she's making sort of statements. She says, this happens and that happens and the other thing happens, but it's it's not plot, it's, it's her observations and comments. And in that process, she's got such a, um, an insightful mind in that process she gets to the heart of what you're trying to do and it really builds trust because you think okay I realize now that she she understands exactly all the things that I'm trying to do here and so when two-thirds of the way in she says now this one I don't think you've got it um I think it needs more something then you think oh well I know that she's right because there's no way she could be wrong because she's understood all the things that I'm doing She's in um, here so deep with you. <laughs> She's in here so deep that like if she sees it, that then it must yeah. be there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh she's she's quite remarkable. Um and and funny. And sometimes I felt like I was writing my jokes for Jessica. I felt mm -hmm. like she's my in a way, she's my ideal reader. And I thought, I know that if nobody else notices this ever, if no other reader ever notices this. Jessica will, and sure enough, that would be something that she would comment on in her notes. Oh, yes. She won't miss it. If it's there, she won't miss it. Yes, she won't miss it. What about you, David? Yeah, I was very fortunate to uh, work with John on two books. I mean, he, um, he's he been, you know, my, he was my first sort of major literary mentor, so it was just really a great, like, knowing John's long history of just sort of lifting up other writers and working tirelessly for um, the short story form in particular, actually. It was, it meant a lot to me to be sort of selected by John and just sort of buoyed up by him, both for Peninsula Sinking and for Chemical Valley. Um, he also, he had he has a great editorial skill of not trying to overdo it <laughs> um, in the sense of not oversteering my work, in the sense of what you're sort of talking about, Alex, um, in terms of the classroom. And he sort of, he would often say like, you know what you're doing, Dave. You know, um, I'm trying, I, I was almost about to do his accent. There. I was about to say, are we gonna get a John Metcalf here? Sure, uh, yeah, you don't wanna hear my bad uh, British accent. 
um, you do want to receive some or receive some of the stationary uh, productions that John Metcalf delivers as well. I have um, but yeah, just to yeah, I, I don't have a letter from him. I probably could dig one up, but I won't. I won't do that just now. But he, um, he yeah. So he didn't try to oversteer my work. Uh, he trusts me as a writer, in other words, and he lets me do what I'm doing. But at the same time, he would raise red flags in pivotal moments, um, which were always greatly super helpful. And he helped me figure out the last story in the book. He helped me figure out sort of how to not make various things too bombastic or too over the top. And um, but always sort of as a question mark. So allowing me to approach and to come up with a resolution on my own uh, in a way that felt honest and natural to me, rather than trying to steer me in a certain direction or trying to offer me, um, you know, an alternate ending to that last story, um, which, yeah, um, he, he did really help me get there, but he helped me find my own way to get there, which I think is a, a crucial skill for an editor. Another question I'd like to ask, because this is the Atlantic uh, Book Awards, and um, it's a subject near and dear to my heart or close to my heart. And um, though the Atlantic Book Awards this year are in Halifax, um, we have a tremendous uh, history in the region of the short story emanating from St. John's and from Fredericton and from Fredericton. So two of you are Fredericton, Fredericktonians, I guess, and, uh, and the Burning Rock, always shifting its uh, cast of characters, I suppose. Uh, but these collections of writers, a community of writers, so I'm not asking about your individual editors here. I'm asking you about uh, literature as a living thing in space. Do you know what I mean? Like a, a short, sto short stories, how they work in Fredericton with like Mark and Carrie Lee Powell. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of great writing coming out of Fredericton, a ton of great writing obviously coming out of St. John. Uh, can we talk a little bit briefly about, uh, I guess, um, not just the scene, not in a kind of facile way, but the way that there is a sort of Atlantic Canadian community uh, that cares about the short story in those two cities and how you have, how you see yourself in it, how you, how you, how you've drawn from it or how, or how that works, the living entity. I can talk about uh, the Burning Rock a little bit because that's been a very important group for me. Uh, the Burning Rock writing group was uh, evolved from a creative writing class taught at Memorial University by my husband, Larry Matthews. Um, and um, so we kept on meeting after the course ended and that was 30 something years ago. And uh, so uh, a number of the people who were in that group in the beginning are still, we don't meet very often now. Uh, and, you know, life gets complicated. People have children, they wander off, they move away, they come back, there's COVID, et cetera. But, um, but we still, we're still a, a group that has many decades of reading to each other. And that has really shaped my experience of what the story is, um, just to be listening. So you come, you bring your bottle of wine and, 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 everybody reads and then you talk about the piece and then um, that's the gist of it. So I've really come to be kind of inspired over and over and over again by all the different, all the different, um, by watching people try out new things, I guess, because none of the writers in that group has remained static for 30 years. Um, and every time they try something else, you think, oh, okay, I, I see what they're doing there. I, I like that thing. Um, so it's been a really kind of organically evolving learning process for me to belong to that group, which has been very important to me. A special, a special, you know, shared endeavor by so many, uh, show, so many great artists there. What about Fredericton? Are, are you I, it's kind of like a weird thing. I know that it's got something to do with the university, but then something to do with the wider community as well in Fredericton, I feel. But. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm currently studying at UNB. Um, 
And so I have access to the faculty and the creative, I'm studying in the creative writing department. So I have, I get to talk to the, the people there, the faculty there. Um, I'm working on poetry actually. So I'm not studying the, sh the short fiction uh, form, but I did get to work with Mark Jarman last year, um, uh, studying fiction. Um, and um, how did we, well, we ended up in the bar, um, you know, drinking beer and talking about stories. Um, and I think there is a, a little community here. I think you're right. Um, but the last few years have seen a real downtick in getting together and mm -hmm. being able to, to read each other's work and, and offer feedback and so on. So I felt pretty lucky that I have the university to lean on in that way, because I think it would have been pretty isolating otherwise, actually. Uh, I understand that. Yeah. Mm. Crazy. Yeah, I've definitely been sort of um, part of a, uh, I've been drawn between Halifax and Fredericton in various ways, like I'm now working and teaching at UNB. Um, I'm sort of, yeah, uh, it's, I just, I don't know, the, the community there has been totally wonderful to me and um, I've published in the Fiddlehead a few times and it's always been great to work with Mark Jarman. So, yeah, I think having the fiddle, basically having the fiddlehead around <laughs> is amazing. And and then worked at Mark Jarman and Ross Lecky and now Sue Sinclair have been doing it at the fiddlehead for a long time. Speaks volumes to, um, you know, uh, the success of literature in this region and is super crucial and vital for the success of literature in this region. So I just think it's wonderful that we have that as a sort of thing to gather around and, um, yeah, I just, you know, I, I hope that that keeps going and keeps thriving. And um, yeah, it, it means a lot to me to have an Atlantic Canadian literary community when you're sort of growing up or coming up as a young writer. And um, that community is changing in a lot of powerful and productive ways as well. And sort of new types of voices are emerging, which is uh, really exciting as well. So I'm excited just to see uh, how that keeps going and and to keep uh, one you know to keep to keep stirring this community together it's a, it's a small place right at the end of the day and there's a lot of astonishingly good work produced here so um, I think we're all here to celebrate that and you know beyond the universities the publishers man like Breakwater and Goose Lane in this case right you have to celebrate have to celebrate again the infrastructure it's I'm, I'm not I'm not diminishing your individual accomplishments but the infrastructure the infrastructure is really important and sometimes in book awards of course no one ever wants to look at the the non-glamorous stuff but i do i'm like that is a lot of hard work uh going on behind the scenes okay we are cresting on 745 i have lots more questions but let's see if this audience has anything to say do you have any questions for these people assembled cyber folk can I just add to what you said, Alex? I, I agree about the importance of publishers because uh, it's well known that collections of stories yeah. uh, don't tend to sell vast numbers of copies and that publishers have to be brave and have to be really committed to uh, sustaining the literary culture uh, just to publish them and that lots of publishers won't look at them. So three cheers for the publishers who Absolutely. are getting behind poetry and drama and short fiction. Exactly, exactly true. And 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 this group are all working. Like that's the whole point is that we're not doing this, uh, you know, for movie deals. Um, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's um, yeah. as I said, a shared beautiful endeavor. Okay, how important is theming? I think theming is a great term. Is it better to keep the scope small or leave it open for uh, more creativity? And Julia, I assume you mean theming like in a single story or across the whole book. We can, I, I think it's possible to say that these whole books have themes, uh, but um, let's see what our group says about that. Theme in individual stories, is it better to keep the scope small or leave it open? Small, go small. That's my, <laughs> that's my opinion. Uh, Boom, yeah. Got it. 
Yeah, I think the uh, like I think that's what I like about poetry too. Um, for the same reason, and why I'm I, I've never written a novel. I I don't intend to write a novel either. Um, the uh, the observation of a small thing um, is important to me. <laughs> so, like as a writer, and also I think that I can um, sort of contemplate the world more easily when I can uh, sort of use a small thing to consider a bigger problem or a bigger issue. It doesn't have to be a, a problem in the academic sense. Um, and so the novel then becomes very overwhelming to even think about. Uh, and maybe, and I mean, that's why I'll never write one. But yeah, go small. Um, I think it's, I think it has potential to be huge. Small has the potential to be huge. Others. It's big all by itself. Yeah. What do you think, David? Uh, I would say embrace the mess. Embrace the mess. That's my, uh, I'm just working on it. I'm telling, this is advice to myself that I'm giving myself right now. Because <laughs> We're uh, here for you, David. You yeah, just, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm working on a story right now, and it's a bit sort of, I'm like, why do these two images like, so I teach about image patterns a lot uh, when I'm teaching the short story. And, you know, Douglas Glover, I'm um, shout out to Douglas Glover, he has this idea about image patterns in an essay called um, How to Write a Short Story, um, which is a good, you know, thing to look at. Um, and it's an excellent piece. And, and he's very mathematical with how he looks at things. And, um, but so, so image patterns. So I'm thinking about image patterns and I'm thinking like, why do I have this story that wants to be about like worms and also wants to be about uh, a storm, you know? And I'm trying to think how those two things work together. And I'm thinking like, I got to cut one or the other, right? Because this is like, what's the dominant image pattern here? But then I think really just asking yourself that question um, or letting your subconscious work through that question um, is probably a better response than trying to overdo a neat thematic patterning um, in any sort of schematic way. So, you know, go with your gut, embrace the mess. That's my thinking. That sounds like really good advice, David. And I think it works. I mean, it always coalesces in some way, ultimately, because those thoughts are both in your head and there's something in there gluing them together, even if it's not a very sticky glue. Okay, I'm going to pair these two questions from Marianne and Mel. They're like, on the topic of creating short story collections, could you speak to the order, ordering, uh, the order process? Did you know the order in which they had to appear, or did you explore that with your editor? Uh, did you write them in the same order in which they're published? And then when compiling your collections, how did you decide what to put in or take out? Do you see what I'm saying? So this is like, I have my pile of stories. How shall they coalesce? How shall they coalesce? Let's hear how that went for each of you. Thank you for the questions. Please, anyone? I started by throwing everything I had into a pile, a digital pile, like a folder file on my desktop, and then um, working on, on each of these stories, even though I had no idea what they would have in common or if they would have anything to do with each other at all. And then when I felt like something had become book-sized, I could um, you know, send it out, to, send it to my agent and stuff. Now, this is the other thing that we haven't talked about is sometimes there's another person involved and that's the agent. And they, in my case, um, my agent is Stephanie Sinclair, who's a wonderful uh, person and, and, and a wonderful agent. Um, but she takes all this crap, you know, um, and made, you know, made a few decisions with me about what would work. I mean, I asked her to do that. And then when we had something a little bit more manageable going on, I could see something start to form, I could see a, a shape coming out. Um, I don't know how else to describe it, but uh, there was a wholeness inside of this mess that I'd made. And my job was to prune away everything that didn't contribute to that central idea, because that made it, that was the, the pattern in which I've taken before and it works for me. It's sort of similar to what David was saying about 
having all your chaos around you, all your, your nonsense, and then finding some organizational principle. And then the editor came in, Bethany, and she, you know, even further started determining where, where those shapes could start and stop uh, too. Uh, the order changed only a little bit. Um, I wanted to separate stories that were too similar to each other so that I could create a lot of drama from one story to the next. I wanted to accentuate the conflict from one story to the next. I think typically an editor would have a lot to say about that. So I'm sort of interested in what the other panelists, what their experience was, but that, that's been mine with this book. Claire? Uh, well, this order, um, this order is mostly so that because it's a link collection and this, the characters recur, the, I, I wanted it to, I wanted the reader to be able to read such and such a story and think, oh, this is the daughter of so-and-so three stories back. So it had to be a kind of logical sequence where you could kind of get to know the people as the stories unfold. There was one story that I did take out and I have to say, I was sad about it. I did discuss it with Jessica at some length. It was very short and I wanted to have unconditional love. So it was love, uh, it was a love story. It was from the point of view of a dog and uh, it was short and I thought an incredibly funny story and other people didn't find it quite as funny as I, I thought it was. I read it at a reading and I could barely read the sentences cause I was laughing so hard. I was so enamored of my own sense of humor. <laughs> um, and uh, Jessica just didn't feel it. And I agreed with her in the end that it had to come out. But I liked the idea of having love from a non-human point of view and that the love of an animal because it's just so unjudgmental. Uh, but, you know, it didn't quite work out. So we discussed it and out came the dog. David? I love I love that story. Yeah, I love that story. I love that idea of of I, I want to read that story actually. I'm interested in this story about I'm interested in the attempt to try to capture unconditional love as well in fiction, which seems uh very ambitious. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, like fiction's all about the conditions usually, right? So it's fascinating. It's a fascinating prompt, I think, actually. Um yeah. Uh, so I think there's a what you know everyone's been indicating to some extent or another is that there's a whole other artistic layer to organizing the collection, um, which is fascinating. And one of the problems I have is like um, one of the problems I have had is not trying to repeat myself, um, not trying to repeat the exact same formula maybe in a story. Um, and so I think in terms of harkening back to the question of of reading of, of being a reader of a collection of stories, I think. Yeah, you, and and sort of what Amber was saying as well. You want to have some some dynamics between the stories as well, right? So from story to story, you want to not just be doing um, the exact same thing, although you still want to have thematic resonances and sort of um, rhymes between the stories. Yeah. So like when I was doing my first book, one of the things that I really I kept thinking that this would be the editor's job to decide on the order of the stories. And it was very, I was very excited about this. I thought this would be a very pragmatic thing. I thought this would very much be like, this is, this is the editor's sort of unique genius is to set the order of the stories in some sort of brilliant way. But I think ultimately it's a, that's, that's sort of the last, basically John refused to do that. And it, it kept being like, oh, so when are we gonna talk genius. about the order? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it kept being, it was one of those things where it's like, so are we going to talk about the order of the stories? And actually I had done a mentorship program as well, Diaspora Dialogues, which is really cool. And, and I recommend um, if you're ever sort of connected to the GTA in that way. Um, but um, but there too, I was like, so are we going to talk about the, the order of the stories? Can we talk about the order of the stories? And people are like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. And then it's just like, perpetual deferral of, of this goal. So, but yeah, eventually I think that that's the artist sort of final and perhaps most important move in, in creating the short story collection. Yeah. Uh, Shelly and Andrew have good questions here too. They're kind of related about like um, 
they they kind of grow out of this and i was just gonna say i have they had the same experience and and uh amber's got a good cat story in there and mm -hmm. uh and uh, uh elaine mccluskey just wrote a book uh with a very tremendous dog in it uh so i don't think uh, don't d d maybe don't trust jessica i think that dogs and cats are enjoying uh i think dogs and cats are doing pretty well during the pandemic myself and rabbits uh 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 but um and i had to cut a story from my collection cut it so ruthlessly after i worked on it for two years and when i so when i look at it when i look at it when i look at the book and i'm like you're not there. I just see. I just see who's not there. You're not there. Uh, you were supposed to be so important in my whole ordering schematic. I had a big plan, uh, but now you're gone because you suck. Uh, <laughs> so that's why you're not there. Uh, but here's a couple good questions. How do you know that you have a collection, uh, or do you set out to write one? Now that kind of comes back. That could bring us all the way around uh, back to why the way I think that short story collections are different um, because I'm. I would be interested to know this. Do you set out to write a short story collection or do you set out to write a story? Uh, and then I'm wondering if this collection of collection makers has a bigger picture sense of collections. So I think these are these are related questions, Andrea's and 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 Shelley's about uh, am I writing stories or am I writing a collection? My short answer is I started out writing a story and then I wrote another story and then after a couple uh, you know after a certain number of words I thought oh this could be a collection so the story the pro project became writing a collection instead of just writing a story that's exactly what I would say as well yeah <laughs> story and then another story and then another story and so on yeah but in I mean, your think, particular oh, I cases, have an idea. I could write a whole book of these things. It yeah. would be really cool. <laughs> Wait, I heard that sometimes. Cases, yeah, the connections, though, the linkages between those, like when you were coming back and you're coming back to the book club again, or you're coming back to the, you know, like, uh, is that the point where you're like, I'm coming back now because I'm making a book, right? I'm coming back. I'm coming back to this. Like, is it after two or like now this is definitely a book if it's got three linked stories in it oh that's a good question for me i think it was more like that that this was going to to this was going to meet the length requirement of the book <laughs> yeah okay. but the book the book club stories that you bring up those were the last ones that i wrote and that was when i knew it was a book yeah mm -hmm. and so i had planned to write a three-parter and spread it throughout the book so that was that's the only case in which I made a decision like that. Yeah. David? Um, yeah, no, I think it's an excellent, an excellent question. And, and the question that I, I'm interested in in terms of the other two writers as well is like, at what point do you leave behind the desire to make a short story autonomous? You know what I mean? Because because for me and my this is definitely something that I was dealing with because I, I was doing some links in my stories as well. And I sort of had to walk away from um, expectations about how deeply intertwined those links would be, because I had to in order for me to make my own short stories as successful as they could be, I had to sort of let them be autonomous, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and so that was important for me, but at the same time, thematically speaking in both my books, the sort of, by the end, as I'm sort of writing the last few stories in the book, I'm very much writing them in, uh, I'm wanting to add something new to the collection in a certain way. So even though they're autonomous, I'm still wanting to sort of add pieces to the puzzle and they're sort of, there's more imperative underlying them at that point. And it's, it's sort of a really exciting <laughs> moment uh, when you're getting towards those new, you're, you're pushing these new pieces out and you're like, yeah, these are gonna like, you know, these are gonna be the ones that I'm gonna work on for two years and then they're never gonna make it into the book, right? <laughs> uh, when you just have that sort of, you get a sort of a new artistic fire as, um, as, you st as the themes start to get, come together and you see what new angles you might take to approach, uh, you know, petroculture, or to approach sort of human animal love in the uh, in the in this weird time and area, which are sort of what my two books are about. Mm -hmm. A lot of bug eating in you too. You have to eat bugs. Okay, so um, 
uh, we have crested upon eight o'clock, but just like in my old days, when I see Gemma Mars name come up, I just have to give the last word to Gemma. So Gemma says that Claire mentioned Jessica as maybe an accidental ideal reader by way of their editor relationship. But I'm curious, as your writing develops over time in the creation of a particular collection, does your ideal reader change? Are there ideal readers for different stories? And do they eventually have to converge in some way as the collection comes together? Where does that sense come from? So that's a doozy of a question. I'm used to Gemma firing these babies off just at the last second. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's, let's try to hit that if we can. The mm -hmm. ideal reader, this is sort of like, because I think Amber had a great point there. It was like, what is being perceived? What is being perceived? <laughs> right? I know what I think I'm doing, but what is being perceived is a very, uh, is a very important question in, in any aesthetic endeavor. So let's talk about these, this ideal reader um, straw man figure, this person that we imagine, and then, and then we'll have to say goodbye. But who wants to go first? I think you want someone who knows what you're doing. Um, <laughs> so you don't have to explain what you're doing or defend why you're doing it. I think that that is the, the op okay. What I'm doing is telling you what you don't want rather than telling you what I want. But what I want is somebody who understands what I'm doing. <laughs> That's just simply put, yeah. Ruth Minikin has a great lyric where I don't know, the great, amazing Ruth Minikin has a line which says, you can't choose your audience. Uh, not even artists can, but we, I think the line is, we want them to see us, see our plan. <laughs> we want, oh, we yeah. want them to see our plan. Can't you see my plan? Uh, um, yeah. So, yeah, I and, get that, yeah. I can't choose, it, but I just want you to see my plan. Uh, uh, yeah. Anybody else on ideal readership? Sometimes you're really, I think you're your own ideal reader. And sometimes you know that you're writing something into a story that probably 98% of your readers are not going to see there. And that's okay. Just think, all right, but I, I still want this, this element or this, this overtone to be in there. So I'm going to work that in anyway. So sometimes it's, it's sort of, ignoring your reader or assuming that you are your reader, I think. Yeah, <laughs> David? Yeah, Natasha, my partner, she's just my ideal reader and she, it's always directed towards her because she, she just mitigates all my worst tendencies <laughs> in always so, uh, in a, but this question of changing over time is fascinating to me as well um, because certainly, uh, yeah, my really, it's two things at once. It's like, you're developing this, this self ideal reader continues to change. And meanwhile, this singular real ideal reader continues to say the same for me. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's my take. It does. Okay. Um, again, on behalf of my family, the McLeod tribe, uh, we thank the Atlantic Book Awards. We thank the Writers Federation of Nova Scotia. We thank Technical Wizardry of Andy and the Organizational Moxie of Heather. Uh, and we appreciate all of you uh, beaming in to listen to us. Um, and oh, there's Marilyn. I have to thank Marilyn again. I'm all, I feel like I'm always thanking Marilyn, uh, uh, but she deserves a lot of thanks. Uh, so um, it's been a real treat talking to all of you. It was a real treat uh, reading all your books. I'm sorry I won't be there uh, on Thursday, but uh, I do send my congratulations to, to all of you. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. For this, it's just great to be in a real chat that isn't uh, potted and just natural kind of going back and forth, which is what happens when you care about something. So uh, thank you. I guess I'm saying goodbye. Andy, am I saying goodbye? <laughs> <laughs> yep, you're saying goodbye. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Have a good night and uh, tune in. Tune in on Thursday, next Thursday for the big reveal. Uh, but read all these books anyway, before Thursday and after. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.
are we are we are we off? 